And now it is my pleasure to introduce the uh, undergraduate speaker uh, for the next stage of this ceremony, Suhani Jalota. Suhani is one of those students who never ceases to inspire and amaze those around her, even those of us who have spent years at Duke among some of the most exceptional students in the world. Suhani came to Duke from her native India. She's a Baldwin Scholar, a special four-year leadership development program awarded to a tiny fraction of the most promising incoming female freshmen. <coughs> During her time at Duke, Suhani actively sought out opportunities for social entrepreneurship and won several entrepreneurship competitions. She is the founder of the Mina Mahila Foundation, a startup that produces low-cost, high-quality sanitary and medical pads while empowering women living in the slums of Mumbai to develop business skills, earn money, and raise awareness about menstrual hygiene. She was recently named one of Glamour Magazine's top 10 college women for her work with the Mena Mahila Foundation. This summer, Suhani will return to Mumbai to focus on her foundation, and in the fall, she'll join the staff of ID Insight, where she'll conduct impact evaluation research on economic development projects. Please join me in welcoming Suhani Jaloka. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Dr. Chul. Um, I wish I could have taken your policy class and classes by so many of the professors here that I've just not had the opportunity to take a class with, Dr. Adme, <laughs> or Adme. Um, I, I, I'm really, really grateful to be standing here in front of this incredible class of, the, of Global Health 2016 students um, and such accomplished professors. I, I absolutely love this class. Um, we have struggled from the Global Health Fundamental Ethics research methods all the way to the senior capstone with Dr. Boyd and Dr. Green um, and Dr. Clemens. And um, we have really just grown up together as a class, as friends, um, as colleagues. And so what I really have to share here today are things that probably resonate very closely with all, all of you, hopefully. I'd like to share three ways that global health has shaped my outlook. The first, about the issues that I learned during my field work that keep me up at night, something that I'm sure we can all relate to. And the second one, about a major life lesson that was reinforced by all that I've learned at Duke. And the third, about the kind of world our generation seeks to create. So lesson number one. I am 21 years old, bubbling with excitement about the opportunities that I have, the changes that I can make. While we're being challenged in Dr. Ariely's research methods class, or, or writing long essays in Dr. Stewart's class, or, or just laughing at Dr. Boyd's jokes, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, be, and being encouraged by, a doctor, by, by Lisa McKean to seize the many of the global health opportunities on campus, uh, only a fraction of which we can ever use. I know there's another girl, half a world away, who has been forced to marry, bear children, stay at home, and take care of her household. She cannot go to school. She's voiceless. She could be sexually assaulted on her way to defecate in an open field or a public toilet as I speak. Or if she has her periods, she uses old rags and leaves as pads are too foreign or unaffordable for her. What is worse, she's not alone. Millions of girls have been silenced by generations of oppression, prejudice, and discrimination. Yet, it is they who have inspired me to make a difference. I know I'm one of the lucky ones, and I'm drawn, like many of you, by the gulf that separates us to make a difference. I'm truly inspired by the work that all of you have done all over the world in incredible projects. At DGHI, when we see challenges that irk us, we just attack them. So my case was no different. I felt deeply about the lack of opportunities for young girls in India. So I decided to create a network of young female entrepreneurs who would run a company that gives them voice by empowering them to talk about the issues that they're most afraid to discuss aloud. Once they start to speak about basic personal hygiene, menstruation and toilets, the world could be their audience. What I have learned and all that I've achieved, I owe it to the woman I met in India slums and their stories and their realities. Had I not seen for myself what it looks like to live without a house when government authorities demolish everything that you own, 
Leaving you on the streets, I would not have understood the pleas of the people. During one of my summer experiences, I once saw a four-year-old boy sitting by a water hose with buckets, filling them with water to carry to his family who was homeless. I saw a girl with multi-drug resistant TB speak about her treatment, or really her pain, as she could not pay for her medicines and she was left untreated. I heard of a seven-year-old girl who was kidnapped and raped in the building where I run my nonprofit. In all these instances, there are problems, hopelessness, homelessness, TB, and sexual assault, which are heightened due to the level of poverty in these areas. But there are also solutions, and people like us motivated to create change. The little boy did everything he could to get water to his family so that they would not die of thirst. The TB patient fought the stigma around the disease and spoke up for herself. And the community got together to take care of the assaulted girl and, her, and bring her assailant to justice. Like all of them, here we are, ready to make a difference. In a sense, that describes the very field of global health. It's risky, yet hopeful and idealistic in the best way. Lesson number two is something I think we all have learned during the last four, year, four years here. When challenges are thrown at you, how you respond is really all that matters. We know that if we just stare at the problems, hopelessness inevitably creeps in. When I first met the women in the Dharvi slums of Mumbai and heard their stories, I would come home to my mother and cry for hours. But in that state, I was of no use to the people whom I wanted to be with and help. My mentor, Dr. Jokin Arpatham, sat me down along with some of the women from the slums who I've formed incredible friendship with over the years now and said, Suhani, the people that you're crying about, they're very happy with their lives. They're resilient and they're strong. And most importantly, they're together. And any group of people that is together will be able to get their voices heard. Now all what you and I have to do is just help them help themselves. That's all. And really, my dear friends, that is all. I learned the importance of a positive outlook on life first from my mother, a powerful woman who never gives up and is extraordinarily resilient. And then from incredible women who I met during my field work who have suffered unbearably yet are committed to improving others' lives. And then from my classmates and professors who are sitting here with me today. My mother, these women, and my inspiring peers and professors chose to face their problems directly. Problems that everyone has in their own way, shape, or form. But you are not your challenges, but you are the way you look at them. I say this because we see intolerable and infuriating challenges in global health. But if we feel hopeless in the face of the massive challenges, we can get lost and not know what to do. But it's only real when you do it. When you gather with others to make a difference, as we have all done in our own ways, when you're on the field talking to people, completely engaging yourself with them, the surrounding and the diversity, the most difficult part about our work, which I think everyone at Duke who has worked on a team before can attest to, is working with people. <laughs> it is getting people to change their behavior to some socially constructed normal. No matter how many failures, even if no one shows up at the village meetings that you've been organizing for weeks and have reminded people about every single day, you just have to keep going. To be optimistic and be determined. Don't stop. As Dr. Tool pointed out, never stop, as that leaves no room for success at all. My final lesson to share with you is this. We should constantly be dreaming and constructing an image of the world we want to create. For me, and possibly many of us, we want, a gen we want our generation to create a world with less poverty and more beauty. A world where the common man is not compromised because of a fault in the system. In our own ways, that is why we're all here, right? Everyone should have access to a hospital, school, clean water, a house, and a toilet. While economic growth in the emerging markets becomes a topic of classroom discussions and government debates worldwide, it still remains an elusive reality for millions of the world's poor. My dream involves these precise people, the children of a lesser God who suffer humiliation, hunger, 
and disease. A young boy should not be left to die at home due to a disease just because he has no access to treatment. A girl should not be sexually assaulted while on the way to a public toilet because she's vulnerable. And a woman should not be kept from the workplace because she's treated unfairly. The common man should not be compromised because of a fault in the system. If these narratives change, women or men, rich or poor, black or white, young or old, in the rural or urban, people would be treated with equity. People should be empowered to have equal opportunity to make decisions in a just society. It may be a seemingly impossible task to create this world where there's more beauty and less poverty, but then that's what dreams are all about. Looking around at all of you, I see the burning passion and fire that we all share to create long-lasting impact. There is little that Duke students cannot do if they come together, especially because we come from all different academic backgrounds and interests and experiences. We have seen that time and again over the last four years. So let us continue to combine our individual strengths to collectively change the world. One cannot sustain success alone. When someone is successful by society standards of success, it is not just them, but the whole community of people who have supported them to stand up that is successful. If you reach the top by flying, rather than climbing the ladder to success, you can crash down very easily. But if you climb the ladder step by step, with each step being relationships forming or values or principles that you live by, you can fall just one step down and then step back up again. We're all standing on blocks, and it is important to recognize those blocks and respect the people in our lives, the organizations that have helped us grow, and the values that have kept us strong, that build the very foundation we stand on. Duke is one of those blocks. And I, and I think the entire class of 2016, will agree with me when I say this, that any success would not have been possible without it. So thank you.